Well, I'm glad you could join us today for another talk about the Holy Spirit and about some of the things that happen as the Holy Spirit interacts with our life and ways in which we're able to use the Holy Spirit. And so today we want to look at maybe the last of our series and what it means to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go back a ways and look at what it means to be anointed first. What is this whole concept of anointing? I don't know that we do this today, and so it's important for us to understand the concept and where it comes from. There are several places in which it talks about this idea of anointing. Anointing is usually given to someone who, in order to make them a special person. And so if you were making a person a king, you would anoint them with oil, olive oil, to make them a king. If you were anointing a prophet, as Elijah did, he would anoint them, and that would make them a prophet. And so that was the process by which some of these things happen. The anointing basically made someone a special person. It recognizes that they are God's child, that they are protected by God, that they are God's people, that uh, there is a special place for them. And so the anointing is something that God would give them in order to make them someone special so that they would become king or prophet. As we look at this idea of anointing, what does this really mean for us today? Let's go back first to the beginning and talk about this idea of being anointed king. Because Israel did not always have a king, and therefore Saul was the first king. They had rejected God from being king over them. They had, they had rejected Samuel or any of his sons from being their leader. And so it was important to see that they were asking for a king that they might be like the nations around them. And so they wanted this idea of king and the way Samuel made Saul king was to call him before the people and to anoint him. Now at the same time when he was anointed, we find the Holy Spirit came upon him in order to make him king. And it is usually that God would do that in order to give them special ability to be the king. It was not just a matter of find the smartest person. It was a matter of find a person that God can use. We also know that God rejected Saul from being king because of his disobedience. And so when he rejected him from being king, he went to find a man after his own heart. And so he was sent to Jesse, to his house, and then Samuel anointed David, even though he's probably a teenager at this time. And so he's very, very young at this time to be anointed king. And yet, here he is, anointed king. It did not mean that Saul didn't sit on the throne. Saul still was on the throne. And so it's important to understand that, that even though David is the anointed king, Saul is still there. Here's the way to describe Samuel when he anoints David as king. He says, and he sent and he brought him in and he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah. Well, it's as simple as that. He anointed him with oil, but it does so much for him then. Because we see that even though this is the thing that makes him king, it also gives him the Spirit of God. And so the Spirit of God comes upon him at that point, realizing he is now the anointed king, and the Spirit is taken away from Saul. And so as we think about this, David's the anointed king, but the anointing doesn't always mean an immediate change in the government. Saul would still be sitting on the throne. And so we see how David is anointed king in the midst of his brothers and the spirit comes on him and Samuel goes away and it will be that David is king. But it isn't quite finished yet. And so God acts in this way to anoint him as king. And I think we can see that even though the anointing has already taken place, 
not everything else has happened. He has given the spirit, and so he has the credentials, he has the blessing from God to be the king. Even though David is the anointed king of Israel, he is not the one sitting on the throne. And so we recognize that David has had to run away from Saul. Saul becomes very jealous. And Saul becomes very angry about David. And he realizes that God has rejected him and that God is no longer giving him favor. He has no favor with God. And so he is angry with David. He decides to come after David. He makes a couple of attempts to kill David while David is still in the palace. And as Saul comes after David, David goes and he hides inside of a cave. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And when Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel, and he went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks, and he came to the sheepfold, by the way, and there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is your day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. And then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. We see the interaction with David and Saul. This is what makes the Bible so human. Uh, he's gone in basically to go to the bathroom, lays his coat in one place. David comes over, just wants some kind of recognition of what David can do. David is a tremendous warrior. Uh, this is incredible that he can sneak over. The army's right there. Saul is right there. Cut off a corner of his robe with a sword, uh, you know, how sharp does a sword have to be? How loud is it? Um, but David is one of those ultimate warriors that he's able to accomplish this. And so he realizes that, you know, he's done something to Saul and he can't hardly stand it because there is this sense of the Lord's anointed. He recognizes that's a special place. He recognizes that something that God has done with Saul. Even though he also knows Saul is no longer the Lord's anointed, Saul is actually not the real king of Israel. Even though he sits on the throne, David is the real king of Israel. Would David have in his right to be able to kill Saul? But Saul, David refuses to do this. Because after all, it is the Lord's anointed. And this cave is very impressive. And yet it's a, it's a place where David chooses to spare the life of Saul. Because of Saul's special place. And that special place is being the Lord's anointed. But he spares him because of God. Because of the relationship with God. And when a person is the Lord's anointed, nothing is done to him. There's actually another time with that when this happens, when David sees Saul and he knows Saul is coming for him. He knows exactly where Saul is, and he watches as Saul makes camp. And he and his men are all there watching, and he asks, who wants to come down with me to the camp of Saul? Well, Abishai volunteers. And I find this amazing because he goes down to the camp of Saul, walks right into the middle of it. All of the men are asleep. There is a deep sleep from the Lord that seems to be over them at this point. Does David know that? Not sure. But certainly David uses that to his advantage. And so here they have found this deep sleep from the Lord that has come over them. And as they get there, Abishai says, well, this is exactly from God because look at what's happened. 
God has prophesied about this, that your enemy will be delivered into your hand, and here he is, he's right there. And a lot of us want to look at the circumstance. And we want to say that the circumstance makes the right and wrong in the situation. And so as we look at the circumstance, certainly God must have done this, and God must be delivering us and giving us this great opportunity, because what better could you get? And so we find Saul, and we find David, and we find David able to take advantage of an opportunity to kill Saul and put an end to this once and for all, and go back and sit on the throne that is rightfully his, and he refuses. And he will not at, let Abishai do it either. And so he, he refuses. He says, the Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And it's for that reason Saul is the Lord's anointed. It's that place that God has given him. And even though the spirit has been taken away from Saul, and Saul is no longer the real king of Israel according to God, he is the real king of Israel according to the people, and he did have the favor of God, and he is the Lord's anointed at one time. And David refuses to do anything against him. He does take from him his spear and his water jug that is at his head. And so as he takes the spear and he takes the water jug and he goes over a little further away and he begins to call out to Saul. Well, laying right next to Saul is the commander of his army. And so he begins to talk to the commander of the army and say, how dare you not protect Saul? You're not doing your job. You're not doing this right. You should have protected your king. And I was able to walk right in and see, here's the spear that was at his head. Here's the water jug that I have taken. And you should do a better job in protecting. And Saul recognizes at this point that David is not going to kill him, that David is not really a threat even though he's heard other people talk about David being a threat, he realizes David really isn't a threat. And, and so as we think about this and, and look at what happens here, David's reasoning is again the same. I will not do anything against the Lord's anointed. Well, this is always an amazing thing to recognize this authority, this place, this gift of being the Lord's anointed. One of the greatest psalms that was ever written is Psalm 23. It's written by David. And as David expresses this psalm, he talks about the Lord being his shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a beautiful poem. It is incredible as it talks about this concept of God being the shepherd, and God being the one that protects, God being the one who provides, that God is the one in so many things that's able to do this for David. And he feels like he's one of the sheep that is being led by God. Perhaps this picture gives us the idea of Psalm 23 as we would look out at the beautiful meadow and realize that, you know, the shepherd has led them here, led them to this great place where they are able to find food, they're able to find water, and God is doing that with his people. Certainly God is doing that with David. But is this psalm really about us? Is this psalm just about David? Or is it about us as well? There's also this little part in the middle. You anoint my head with oil. Well, that's true. I mean, David was king. David was anointed on his head with oil in order to make him king. But we take this as our psalm. We're not a king. And so can we really do that? 
Can we claim the Lord is our shepherd? We won't want, and he does all these great things for us. He lives with us in the dangerous times, in the valley of the shadow of death, and that he will be there to comfort with a rod and a staff. That's what they use to be able to guide sheep with. He prepares a table in the presence of enemies. He says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And so David recognizes the greatness of this anointing that has taken place with him. And so let's look a little bit further into this idea of anointing. Is it just for kings? Is it just for David? Or does it also apply to us? Well, we know it comes up in Isaiah. In Isaiah 63, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To bring good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. What a tremendous passage that someone would be able to do this. But he says it's because the spirit of the Lord is upon him. The Lord has anointed me too and Wow, look at all the blessings that are here. Bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, open the prisons and make freedom a possibility, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now there's also the vengeance part, and so realize it's a judgment of God and make sure you're on the right side of that. And then to grant to those who mourn a headdress instead of ashes. How great the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that we're like an oak of righteousness because God has anointed us to proclaim that. This is the same passage that Jew Jesus uses in Luke chapter 4. When he is given the scroll of Isaiah, he opens the scroll to this passage reads this passage and says to them, this passage is now proclaimed in your hearing. And certainly we recognize Jesus as being anointed by God. After all, Jesus is the Son of God. He is also referred to as the King or the King who is coming in his kingdom. And so it does follow that Jesus would also be a King and anointed as King. It's a little different because it's not a physical horn that was brought and was uh, dumped on his head in his anointing. It's, it's a different kind of spirit when we see this. And we recognize the anointing of Jesus, but there wasn't really a time where a prophet came and anointed Jesus, at least with olive oil. Uh, Jesus was anointed several times. He was anointed in his feet. He was anointed with his head. And yet those were not to make him king. Uh, maybe the closest we would come was at his baptism when the Spirit came upon him. And that may be the closest thing we get to his being anointed by God as the Spirit now comes on him just as it did on David when David became king. And so we recognize that God has given this anointing, that he is the fulfillment of all the prophecies. And every time the prophecy was about the anointed one or the promised one, that's who Jesus is. We see how the disciples are also referred to as the anointed. In Mark chapter, chapter 6, as he sends them out, he says this, and they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Certainly they had been given power to be able to accomplish healing. And they could do it just because they said, or they could do it because they laid hands on, or they could do it and were given several different options. One time Jesus makes mud and puts it on the eyes, and we don't have a lot of recordings of the disciples and how they did. We know Peter just grabbed a guy's hand and helped him up in Acts chapter 3. 
and he was healed. And yet here it talks about the fact that they anointed many with oil. And so there is a way for them to perform not their own anointing, but to perform healing. And so this is another time when we see anointing being possible. And so as we think about this, it's very close to what happens in James chapter 5 as he talks about the elders and calling for the elders of the church that they might pray and anoint someone with oil. And so it would be that kind of anointing, recognizing the power of prayer and recognizing that God can heal. And so that's another way in which this idea of anointing gets used. And I think it's important for us to understand all of these aspects of anointing as we talk about this last part. Well, we also see in 2 Corinthians, as Paul talks about this anointing, he talks about it in terms of other disciples. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, As surely as God is faithful, our word has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I was not yes and no, but in him was always yes. So he's giving this positive side of who Jesus is and what he does. He says, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That's why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Well, he gives you a whole lot of things right there real quick. He says, first of all, God's promises are always yes, that he is doing these promises. And then, and yet we also see that God establishes us and he has anointed us. He's real specific about that, that we have this anointing. He has also put his seal on us. The seal that he's talking about is much like a, a wax seal that someone would put on a letter. It's not a waterproof seal or something like that. But the wax seal was dripped on to the letter at the, at the seam, and then a stamp was placed into the wax so that you could tell the wax was still intact and had not been broken. And you would have to break the seal. And the stamp that was used was their own stamp. It was like a signature. This is my stamp that I sent this letter to you. You are mine. That's what it means for us. And so we have this anointing, and then he has put his seal on us. In other words, he stamped us with his stamp that says, this is a child of God. This is one who belongs to God. And he's given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And so all of these things talk about how positive God is and how much God has been able to do for us. I know sometimes we see all the difficulty in the world and all the things around us. And yet look at what God describes we have this anointing, and this anointing is so great that he has anointed us, he has put a seal on us, he has given us a guarantee, and yet it's just like David. David was anointed when he was very young, and he did not actually sit on the throne for many years, because that was still to take place. And David had a lot of difficulty, and he was chased through the desert by Saul, and he tried to kill him. And so we may have a lot of difficulty in our life, even though we have already been anointed. Even though we already have his seal on us, even though we are already guaranteed. And yet, it, we still find the difficulty. And we still have to deal with all the people who are after us and all the hard things in the world. And yet the Spirit is still there and God has still done all of this with us. Well, there's two passages that are very specific in John. And one of these is in 1 John 2, and starting in verse 20, he says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. 
And so he describes here this anointing that we have by the Holy One so that we are able to have this knowledge, this understanding of God. We had talked in the last couple of videos about the fact that God teaches us. And so here he talks about this knowledge that we're able to have because of this anointing. And maybe you get a better sense of what the anointing was all about. It's a choosing. It's not a perfect. It's not a place where it solves everything. And yet it's a promise of God. It's a beginning of God. It's the blessing of God. It's giving the spirit and all of these things. But he, John sees this so clearly. We have this anointing so that we can know and that we can understand. And this anointing is the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's really trying to give us and really trying to say to us is this Holy Spirit helps us realize through this anointing and if we can just grasp the fact of what it means to be the anointed of God, that that's a special place, that no one touches you there. And we can perhaps look back at David and all of his respect for the Lord's anointed, whether the person lives up to it or not. His respect for that position of being the anointed. And sometimes as Christians, maybe we need to recognize that as well. Whether we live up to it or not, we are the Lord's anointed. Now certainly recognize that you need to straighten that out. Saul did not have a chance to straighten that out because he does not have the grace and mercy of Jesus that we find in the New Testament. And what an incredible thing it is to realize what Jesus has done for us. And this anointing might take place when we are very young, and yet now we're able to fulfill and able to see so much more. Just down a few more verses, and we see this in, in verse 26. He says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie just as it has taught you abide in him we know that God has given us this anointing there's a lot of people who are trying to deceive us that Jesus is not the answer and that you know, there's a lot bigger problems in the world and we can solve our own problems and if we can just get enough technology or science behind us, we can promote mankind into a new generation. And it's not about education or technology. You realize the anointing comes from God. It's the Holy Spirit that has been poured out upon us and he is given us of his Holy Spirit. In Romans 5, it's been poured in, the love of God's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so he talks about this idea or this concept of being anointed. And I think maybe we need to live like that person that David respects. That we need to believe what the anointing is about. And the fact that God has given us this anointing. We need to live to it. We need to accept it and understand it and recognize that even in the frailty and the weakness that we feel, we are the Lord's anointed. And he has given us this place. And it's important that everyone recognize this, that this is what God has for us and is able to do for us. The same way David had respect for Saul and when Saul was perhaps not doing the things of God, I think we need to learn that as well. The Holy Spirit teaches us that we need to have respect for those people who are the Lord's anointed, who are Christians, who have been anointed by the Holy Spirit and that we would never do harm to them, that we would never say anything bad about them that we would never ridicule them or run them down, that we would be the ones who would lift them up. That even when it seems like the perfect opportunity to do something about them, that's God's place. That we would respect God and his chosen people. That we would understand what God wants. And even if they are violent against us, as David gives example, we're not going to be violent back to them.
We are going to be people who forgive. We are going to be people who treat the Lord's anointed as if they are someone special. And we are going to expect that we are the Lord's anointed and that whatever God needs done, we can get done. It's an incredible thing to realize how powerful this can be as we heal the wounds that exist between people today. That if all of us would just respect each other as if they were the Lord's anointed, as if they have the Holy Spirit, and if God has anointed them, then we would never do anything against them no matter what, no matter what their life looks like or no matter what the harm that they cause because they're just jealous. They've just got something on their heart. There's an agenda. There's something that has been taking them away. But we also recognize that Jesus brings forgiveness. And he's able to bring them back. And he's able to make them whole and clean and pure again. So that they can truly be the Lord's anointed. Who of us is without sin? We're just not. But he's given us and anointed us with his Holy Spirit. He has sealed us with his Holy Spirit and he has given us a guarantee that we have a place with him. How great it is if we're able to work this together as the Lord's anointed, as the Holy Spirit has come upon us. And even though our world doesn't look perfect right now, and even though there's lots of frustrations and things that we seem to have to deal with, we are the Lord's anointed. And there will come a time when we sit with the king. What a great time that's going to be.